But uh, there's this wonderful verse, and, and the title of it that was on the, on the thumbnail is uh, that we dwell with the high and lofty one. That's one of the names of God in Isaiah here, in Isaiah 57, 15. Thus saith the high and lofty one that, had, that inhabits eternity and whose name is holy. Right? So we have been, um, for the last several years, we've started the year with a 21-day fast. And we're doing that again this year, as many churches are. I've seen that, you know, in multiple places around the country. Uh, churches teaching on fasting and prayer and, and starting the year off with the three weeks, the 21 days. And I guess a lot of you know that in the book of Daniel, he, he did a fast. And it was 21 days when the angel showed up. And, and the angel said, look, I've been, I've been trying to get here. There's been a lot of warfare in the spirit. It's not that we didn't hear the prayer. It's that I've been contending in order to get here. And that's a really important thing to remember right now because uh, I think partly that many of us are, uh, are feeling the fatigue, the battle fatigue of 21 months now of, of lockdown and losses of jobs and losses of loved ones. And I spoke to somebody this week who uh, lost three close people in their family within the last year and didn't get to uh, have a funeral for one of his own parents. And, uh, you know, we've never lived in a time, I mean, if you get, I guess if you went back to World War II, there's probably similar things that might have happened. But in our lifetimes, uh, we haven't had this kind of radical, uh, I don't know, up, upheaval in, in what we would call normal. And, and when it comes to burying a loved one, and, and especially when it's a primary person like your mother or your father, and, and you don't feel like you get that closure, that, that's not an easy thing to deal with. And that could be just one of many things, like losing a job or being threatened with losing a job, because the threat of it is also very stress-inducing, just that you feel like you're being forced to do something you might not want to do in order to keep your job. So lots of reasons, but here it is. It says, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. And as I was fasting today, and you know, we, what we want to do is not go on a diet, right? Instead of eating food, we're eating the word. We're digging in deeper into the word. We're praying. We're seeking the Lord. We're listening to worship music. Uh, another person that I spoke to, um, I, just, I just shot him a playlist of different worship songs that he could listen to when the stress was starting to, to overtake him. In his particular case, it was starting to debilitate him. But we have weapons, right? We, we fight back. And, and this picture of him as the high and lofty one, just it was, it was a great picture for me today to remember that. He says we're going to dwell with him there in that place. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. And that's one of the many great benefits that we get from fasting is it, it can humble us. <laughs> and it reminds us that we can, we can be over-reliant on, on quick fixes. Because in our culture, very few people ever get hungry. <laughs> And there's convenience stores everywhere. And, I mean, God forbid you have to buy something at Newark Airport. It's going to be like $9 for a bottle of water. And people pay it. Like, what? Like, if that's not, whatever, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm venting. I don't mean to vent. But you get something that you could buy a whole case of water for $3.99. And they charge you 9 bucks for one bottle. It's highway robbery. Well, go to the water fountain, I guess. I don't know. There's got to be a way around it. But, you know, like, that's convenience. Whenever we feel the, the least bit of hunger or the least bit of, of lack, we can fill that void quickly. And when we fast, we're, we're reminding ourselves, well, no, uh, that's not our source. God is our source. Right? I quoted it Sunday. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. Right? So when we, when we focus on that and we keep bringing ourselves back to being hungry and knowing that we're not going to die, the hunger goes away, you know, there's, your body just gets used to a certain pattern, and it's good to break that pattern. And when you break it, focus on things like this. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. If you were raised Catholic, you might remember the act of contrition. So that's this contrite heart idea. And in, in one of the Psalms... Uh, 
this is repeated, not just in Isaiah, but in one of the Psalms as well. A broken heart and a contrite spirit is what, what pleases the Lord, right? Not broken heart that you're sad because of, of some loss or deprivation, but the repentant heart when we recognize we've made a mistake. And another conversation I was having, and the person said, you know, partly due to stress, I, I wasn't as friendly to my neighbors as I should have been. And he went and apologized to them and, and said, you know, that's not who I want to be. I'm sorry if I overreacted over something, you know, that, that really in the big picture is not a big picture. And that's so important for us to do that, right? That's, that's contrition. That's recognizing, even though we might have had a right to be upset about something, that that's, you know, we missed the mark of who we're aiming to be. And we should ask people forgiveness for that. And that's all the Lord is saying. Remain humble, right? I dwell with those people in that high and holy place, those that have a contrite and humble spirit, I want to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite ones. I have seen their ways, but I will heal them. Isn't that a good verse? Isaiah 57, 18. I have seen their ways, but I will heal them. And all of us have this happen. All of us fall short in different ways. And it's, you know, often when you think you don't have a problem in an area, where it'll leak out because you forget to keep your guard up in that area or whatever. Just certain people know how to push your buttons, right? Anybody? Okay, thank you. You're allowed to talk in this church. <laughs> he says, I have seen their ways, but I will heal them. I will guide them and restore comfort to Israel's mourners, creating praise on their lips. That's a reversal of a circumstance right there because we don't think of praise during mourning, but we did a, a, a wonderful memorial service yesterday, uh, and there was praise for the life that the person lived, for the impact that the person had, for the amazing testimony that he left behind and, and, and changed lives because his life was changed, and then he devoted his life to helping other people change, not because he was perfect by any means, but because he was seeking to do it. And, and there was praise on the lips of the mourners, yesterday and there will continue to be because this life is not the end we're going to see them again peace peace the bible says to those far and near says the lord and i will heal them he repeats himself so i'm going to shift over to the new testament now from isaiah to john chapter 13 and jesus is speaking to the disciples and he says my time here is brief okay so John chapter 13 is the scene in the upper room. It's when Jesus washes the feet of Peter and, and tells them, you know, the bad news that you'll be searching for me. And as I told the Jews, you cannot go where I'm going. All right. Now, we just read in Isaiah that he dwells in those high and lofty places, right? And that we can be with him when we're of that contrite and humble spirit. So... This is not an easy thing for them to understand because he says, you cannot go where I'm going. And Peter says, Lord, where are you going? Jesus says, Peter, you cannot come with me now, but later you will join me. Peter says, why can't I go now? I'll give my life for you. Can anybody relate? It's easy to make the promise. Not always so easy to deliver on the promise. I like to think of Hannah in the Old Testament. Right, who uh, was, was feeling quite a bit of persecution from her husband's other wife, which I think is a mess to begin with, to have more than one, but whatever. And, and this woman was tormenting her because she couldn't have children, and the other woman, Penaniah, did have children. And what, what promise did, did Hannah make? Do you remember? Lord, if you will give me a child, I'll give the child back to you. Now, how many know it's easy to say that? And then when you get pregnant and, and, you, and the baby is born and you have to give him back, that's another whole step in the process, isn't it? But what did she do? She gave the child to the Lord. And what did the Lord give her back? More children. And amazing how that works, isn't it? See, you, you stay true to what you promised the Lord, and then he, he more than he gives you the increase. Um, I'm looking at Stella in the back, and she suffered a terrible tragedy to lose a child and, and, and had the faith to name her second child Elisha because that means double portion. Amen? 
That's how we're supposed to live. He takes what the enemy meant for evil and turns it for good. All things work together for good. Wow, that's a hard one, isn't it? It's hard to see in the moment how that could be. And yet he does. And we speak that double portion to Elisha and his life and how God is going to use him. I'll give my life for you, Lord. Why can't I go now? I'll, I'm ready to die for you. And Jesus says, really? <laughs> Will you really give your life for me? And again, let's just be humble and contrite about this because all of us, I'm guessing, have been in this situation where we thought we would follow through on something and then fell short on what, what we aimed at. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. Verse 14, I'm sorry, verse 1 in chapter 14 says, don't get lost in despair. Maybe it's one conversation. Even though it's the beginning of a new chapter, maybe he's speak, speaking to Peter, who he just said, you're going to deny me three times, but don't get lost in despair, Peter. I know what I just told you is devastating news, but don't lose heart. Believe in God and keep on believing in me, Peter. I think you could read it that way. We'll find out someday. Sometimes the chapter divisions don't always hit in the exact right spot, right? So then he says, my father's home is designed to accommodate all of you. If there were not room for everyone, I would have told you that. Guessing that we've all heard sermons about the big mansion that we're going to have someday in heaven, right? But I've always tried as much as I can to say, as it is in heaven, let it be on earth, right? So when we read these scriptures, there can be one more than one lens that we look at. It's not just that the, the mansion that you're going to have in heaven is going to be so beautiful, but his father's house is also here on the earth. <laughs> it's the body of Christ. We are his body. We're his hands. We're his feet. And, and this house is his house as well. So we, we take care of it. We, we try to take care of the house. Don't bring coffee in the sanctuary. And spill it on the nice light rug that we have. It's his house. I want to take good care of his house, right? My father's home is designed to accommodate all of you if there were not room for what everyone. So that means there's nobody out there that he wouldn't want in this house, oh, provided that they're going to you know, not hurt anyone, right? Because if somebody was in, in a certain state of mind that they wanted to, to hurt people, we would have to wait until we could get them healed of that. But, you know, everything else, bring them in. This is where they belong, because the Father's house is full of healing. If there weren't room for everyone, I would have told you that. I'll never abandon you. I know I skipped there all the way up to verse 18, but important for us to remember. I'll never abandon you like orphans. I will return to be with you. And for those that are suffering at home right now, especially with this lockdown and, and with very legitimate concerns, okay, like we, we, we fully understand it's not our job to judge anybody about how you're handling what's going on. But we do know that isolation is punishment. So it's hard to always see the impact that that isolation is having on us and how much it's impacting our thoughts. So we're not here to shame anybody or confuse anybody, but just to say, read this verse, John 13, 18, I will never abandon you like orphans. I will return to be with you. And my goal tonight is just to get you to focus on that high and lofty one. I'm the high and lofty one. You can dwell with him. It doesn't matter if you're alone. You're not alone because he's with you. And it's that humble spirit and that contrite heart that Isaiah 57 referred to that he's looking for in us as well. So then I wanted just to also give us a little booster shot of reminder from the Psalms. And David in Psalm 37 has a lot of them, Psalm 34 and 37, if you're looking for some meat uh, to, to chew on in the word while you're fasting. But you probably have heard Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a righteous man, and I'll say, and woman, the steps of a righteous man and woman are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. So that's a good prayer. Speak over yourself. Thank you, Lord, that today, is before I leave my house, you order my steps as I go. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I'm, I'm going to keep my mind set on you, and as I delight myself in you, you will put your desires in my heart and order my steps. He delights in my way, it says here. Though I fall, if I make a mistake, if I'm the Apostle Peter... And I fall, and I'm utterly cast down because I'm so disappointed that I let you down, Lord. 
The Lord upholds him with his hand. And he did say that. Don't be in despair, Peter. Believe in me. Keep on believing me. Even though you're going to deny me, don't lose heart. For the Lord will uphold you with his hand. And then David says, I've been young and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants or his seed begging for bread. Let's just confess that over ourselves. I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. Thank you, Lord, that we are your righteous ones. You made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. He is ever merciful. This is the person who's received God's mercy, is ever merciful and lends. Right? So not only do we not beg for bread, we're able to have an excess, a surplus that we can lend to others, and that's a blessing. A little further in verse 35, I've seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree, yet he passed away and he was no more. And that's also a big part of this psalm in the beginning in the first few verses. He says, don't get discouraged when you see the unjust people prospering. Because their day is going to come. And this is where he's saying that they passed away and they were no more. Indeed, I looked for that prosperous, wicked person with great power, but could not find him. And then he says in verse 37, Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man or woman is peace. What does that mean, mark the blameless man? doesn't mean if your name is Mark that you're perfect. <laughs> yeah, it just means notice. Keep your eye on the person that walks this way, whose steps are ordered by the Lord, who's, who's a disciple of Jesus and, and trying to live it out. Again, nobody's perfect, but we're supposed to encourage one another. Iron is supposed to be sharp, sharpening iron, right? That's why we live together, why, why we don't forsake the assembling together so we can be in fellowship together and, and encourage one another and pray for one another. The future of that person is peace because, because that's who God is. He keeps us in perfect peace when we keep our minds stayed on him. And I'm going to keep repeating it because he is the high and lofty, excuse me, the high and lofty one. And he's saying, I will dwell with you in that high and lofty place. I'll bring you above the circumstances that you're walking through. And you'll be with me in that place. And the future, my future is peace. I touched on Nehemiah a little bit on Sunday. Just spoke about him. But I wanted to just dig a little deeper tonight. And, and I, I use the word burden. And often burden is, is uh, looked at as a negative. But I don't think it is a negative when you're a Christian. Because if the Lord puts a burden on your heart, then there's a reason he wants you to stay focused on something. Anybody can know what I'm talking about here? Been through this situation where he asked you to do something that was a stretch, let's say, right? That was going to that was gonna stretch you beyond what you would normally do. And, and when you think it might pass, but it doesn't pass because it stays on your mind. And, and it's not that you're obsessing about it. It's because the Lord is highlighting something to you that he wants you to think about and, and pray into often. And it's easy to, if you know the story. He was living in the palace, even though he was a slave. He had a great job. And when he talked to one of his uh, other compatriots there, he said his brother had come back from Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. This is bothering me. I'm going to put this down. Now I feel better. <laughs> so uh, here he is in the palace. He's doing really well, all things considered. Consider he's a slave. Most of the slaves weren't living in the palace. And he's the cupbearer to the king. So he's got access to the best conditions that he could be living in. And it would be easy for him to say, oh, well, you know, too bad for them. But that's not what happened. They were there in great reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I wonder about this fast sometimes. I wonder if it was such a burden on him that he lost his appetite. Not, not in an unhealthy way, not, not in a way that 
we're, we're taking on more of the burden than we should. But the thing that he's putting on your heart is so strong in your heart that that's more important than eating, right? Sometimes if you're in a depression, you don't want to eat. That's not good. But this is different. This is, is, is digging in with the Lord. And, and if I could ask you to open your heart to the amount of pain that's in our culture right now, especially with this Omicron that's coming through. And, you know, again, I don't want to go too far off the trail here, but it seems like the, there's a lot of smoke, but not so much fire to, to the amount of actual problem it is. But because people are so, oh, man, this thing just doesn't want to cooperate tonight. Stay there. It's, uh, people are, are more rattled about it than the facts would dictate, in my, in my interpretation. I'm not saying don't be careful, but we're, we're in a, a bit of a frenzy right now as a culture. And get a burden for America, right? I know that's what Dutch Sheets was talking about today. Even you know, It was more of a political reason of why he was asking people to pray. But it's the same idea. Like, it, when the Lord puts something on your heart that's a burden, it's not necessarily a negative thing. He's asking you to ramp it up a little bit and take this thing really seriously, as serious as you take food, right? And, and spend your time with me and, and stay focused on what I'm asking you to do and, and what God ended up asking him to do as we just go through this a little further. He starts praying, and he says, both my father's house and I have sinned, right? Now, Peter Wagner uh, studied a lot about prayer and wrote a lot about prayer, and he called it identificational repentance, all right? Now, you got to be careful because this could be taken out of context too, but even if we haven't particularly sinned, the reason Nehemiah was in captivity is because God judged Israel for their sin. And because he's Jewish, even though he didn't commit the specific sin, they were suffering in captivity in Babylon because of the sin of Israel. And, and it's pretty dramatic the way God describes it. He said, before he brought the judgment, he said, I'm going to take Israel like a man takes a dish, and I'm going to turn it upside down, and I'm going to wipe it clean. Like, so there was many, many decades of sin, uh, especially in the leadership in Israel, for God to have, have done that. And now Nehemiah was suffering, it, suffering from it, but he could have said, well, it wasn't my fault. But he identifies with his ancestors and said, forgive us, Lord, my fathers and I have sinned. We've acted, and acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Now, you would think, why does he have to remind God about his commandments? God is the one who wrote them. He says, remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations, but... If you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I've chosen as a dwelling place for my name. Now, now you can see where he's going with this, right? It's like, well, yes, you said there was going to be a problem, but then you also said if, right? There's the but in verse 9. I love, I love the but God verses in the Bible. Yes, there is punishment for sin, but... If we return to you and we keep your commandments and do them, even though some were cast to the farthest part of heaven, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen. And what's the place that God chose as a dwelling for his name? Thank you. You're awake. Yes, Zion, the city of David. Awesome. God loves that place. I've chosen that place, but it's burned down. They just came back from there, and they said the walls are burned down, and the people are in despair that are living there. Please let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And who's the man? The king, right? He's, he's about to go and ask for help to get money that's going to be needed to rebuild Jerusalem. Boy, you better be fasting and praying for that one, because one bad day with the king, and it's curtains. Right, But because he's prayed up, because he's focused, because he's not in a car brush <laughs> and all groggy from too much food, right? there's just something about fasting and praying that focuses your mind and puts a sense of urgency on the thing that the Lord is putting on your heart. It's not a bad thing to have a burden from the Lord. 
especially when that burden is about helping people come out of the bondage that they're in right now. Well, well, they always are in, but like especially there. And it says, I was the king's cupbearer, right? Now, that's right at the beginning of Nehemiah. And we already alluded to that, but he had already found favor just by being in this position. He prayed it, and then he did find favor with the king. And that's partly what I was trying to say about the other thing about fasting and praying and pressing in and getting a word from the Lord, right? He saw in response to this prayer that the king said yes, he knew that was a word from the Lord um, to go back and rebuild. And when he first got there, I don't know if you remember this part of the story, but the first thing he did when he got there was just circle around at night and, and pray and say, wow, yes, they were right. This place is a mess, but I know you told me to do this. Anybody remember how many days it took to rebuild the wall? Easter, you can't get, keep answering all the questions. It's like that bright student in the front. Oh, I know. Love you. Yeah, I think it was 53 days. I could be wrong. I thought it was 53, but there was no way he would have thought they would have got it done in 53 days, right? But, but God, and when God's behind it, there's a tailwind behind you. You know, you've got that breeze behind you. You've got that, the momentum of God that you know he's in it. I could give you a personal example when we were about to move out here and we had decided we were going to plant the church and we were leaving Essex County. We put our house on the market for a certain price and within 48 hours we had the asking price for our house. And we felt like that was the, the Lord just opening the door and saying, go ahead, I want you up there, right? Because my, my wife was thought I was crazy to ask for the price, thought it was asking for too high of a price. And I'm not just saying that because she's not here. She, she would agree if she was here. Because it did seem like a high price, but I did, you know, prayed about it, and that's what he said. And when the person came to the closing, <laughs> his mortgage had fallen through, but the guy had so much money, he was able to just pay cash for the whole house. And yeah, like, that's a gift, right? The guy just handed a gift to us. I said, I should ask for more money. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. So I'm just going to end back in, in the book of Acts because, um, well, for a lot of reasons, but we live in the book of Acts in many ways. And there are 28 chapters in the book of Acts, and I would argue that we could say that today is the 29th chapter of the book of Acts because that was when the church got started. That was when Holy Spirit fell. And the world started getting turned upside down. And there was all kinds of riots and all kinds of fights and opposition and persecution. And, and the idea that we could be Christians and not face persecution is silly if you read the Bible. He said that we would. But keep your eyes on the prize. Press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling that I give you. Don't be foolish and, and use persecution as a badge. But if you're going to confront people about sin and you're going to challenge their worldview, they're not going to like it, right? Whatever critters are in there, whatever demons are harbored in there, they don't want to come out. They like where they're living. Jesus had such an anointing on his life that they didn't have an option. When he walked in the room, they just basically waved the white flag and said, don't persecute me, please. I'd, I'd rather go in those pigs. And maybe that should be like a Selah moment for us. If that's not happening when we walk in the room, that's another thing we could fast and pray about. Because he set the mark for us, right? He, he set that example. I have seen it happen when Trisha walks in the room. <laughs> she's just got discernment, and I think they pick up on that. I don't know how it is, but that's, that's a gift that she has. And she didn't ask for it, okay? It's just the way it works, so God bless it. He's, she's been used mightily to help people get free. So the Apostle Paul uh, was radical in the way he was serving Jesus. So I don't know about you, but I want to be radical. I don't want to be lukewarm. I want to be part way. And I just love this scene. I, again, touched on it a little bit. It says in Acts chapter 14, verse 19, Jews from Antioch and Iconium came to Lystra. They persuaded the multitudes and stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. All right? Now, let me just tell you, when they stoned people in those days, they were pretty good at this. So if they thought you were dead, you were probably dead, okay? Now, I have no problem believing that he really was dead. Because then it says, however, 
That's like that word, but, right? However, when the disciples gathered around him, even though it doesn't say they prayed, but I'm guessing they prayed, they knew that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and here we are. He rose up and ran from that city. <laughs> no, he didn't leave Lystra. He went back into Lystra, the place that killed him. And we're feeling persecuted? He had every option to say, man, that was a tough crowd. I'll take a break from them for a while. He didn't. Like, this really inspires me not to complain about losing my tax exempt status. He went right back to the people that stoned him to death, maybe. Either way, he rose up. Even if he wasn't dead, he rose up and went back into the city. The next day, he departed with Barnabas to Derby. right? So that just gives us a little bit of a mindset. If we're going to take this seriously, we want to see people's lives change, which frankly is a very selfless goal. Right? There's not an immediate reward to seeing other people get free, but boy, there's crowns in heaven, man. There is all kinds of equity being built up in the bank account of heaven, and Paul uses that specific language. He says, it's not that I need it. When, when somebody gave him a gift, it's not that I, that I need it, but your account in heaven is being credited. Right? So that's the redemptive things we do. Carolyn, sitting on the front row here, she runs a ministry in Patterson. You know, Patterson uh, is, was a burden that the Lord put on your heart. Is that fair to say? And uh, how many years ago now when you walked in the Alabama Projects? 19 years is what I would have guessed. Yeah, 19 years ago, the Lord put a burden on her heart to go in there and use the skills that she had developed in corporate America to help, especially to help the single mothers and to get job skills and how to write a resume. And I might be summarizing it here a little too briefly, but basically the people that were running the place, and it was a big place, they laughed at her. And, and they mocked her, and they said, oh, another goody two-shoes, you'll be here two weeks and you'll be gone. And here it is 19 years later, not gone. Ha countless lives have been touched. You'll never know all the lives that were touched, right? But it's not because she makes lots of money. It's not because it, it pays so much money that, that corporate America was paid, but it's because there's a burden that the Lord puts on your heart. And money is not the best motivator. The will of God is the best motivator. And it's amazing how he provides for us in the midst of all that because he knows he can trust us with it because that hasn't become our God. And I can't help but tell this story because it's so fresh in my mind. There was a woman there named Lourdes who knocked on the door one day and, and was one of the clients that, that needed help. And, and the ministry basically helps people navigate through the social services and, and provides a lot of, of resources that under-resourced people can tap into at no cost. And uh, she was basically a working homeless person who had two sons and wasn't making enough money to support her sons. Well, Carolyn looked past the package and saw a gift in this lady, Lourdes. And as time went by, she gained more and more authority, came in as a servant, then went on the payroll, and then became the assistant executive director. Fair? Right-hand person. Like, wow. Talk about rising up. There was so much talent in this lady that nobody could see. But when she was given a chance, there she was. And I went there uh, when they were about to dedicate a new building that they had gotten from the town. And all of the clients, I'll call them, the people that were coming for the services, looked at her like, wow, look what happened to her. She came in needing the services, now she's helping us. That gives me hope. Amazing. But the rest of the story, I don't remember that guy's name. Who's the rest of the story guy on the radio? Anybody? Paul Harvey, yeah, the rest of the story is so cool. She comes to our church. Lourdes does, and tells like a, a version of the story, right? So here's the story. She left Puerto Rico because she was in a very abusive relationship with the man she had married, and she was in America to, to get away from this guy. Her father was still in Puerto Rico, as she's telling this story, and 
the doctor that was taking care of her father, when the father was in the hospital, he had cancer, heart disease. Okay, had a heart problem with his heart. The doctor walks in, sees the chart, sees the last name, and says, oh, I used to date a girl with that last name. And it, was, it happened to be his daughter, Lourdes. And he said, so you're the guy, the doctor says, you're the guy that wouldn't let me date your daughter. Why should I take care of you, basically? No, he didn't do that. But, like, what's the odds of that happening, right? That the doctor meets the father of the girl he wanted to date, and she left. So what does the doctor say to the father? How's Lourdes doing? He said, well, she had a little rough spot, but she's doing well now. She's got a nice job. Give me her number. Get on the phone. One thing leads to another. Cupid goes, comes in with the arrow, right? And she goes, comes to our church and says, thank you so much for supporting the ministry. It's called the Family Success, Family Success Center. New Destiny Family Success Center. Talk about a perfect name. Uh, because of your support, I'm moving back to Puerto Rico to marry this man. And we're going to be living in, in, in a big, beautiful house. Me and my boys are going to be moving back to a big, beautiful house. And if you hadn't helped support that ministry where the doors were open, I don't know where I'd be right now, right? Not because you thought that was, you don't know who the person's going to be, but you know if you keep opening the door, it could happen. If you don't open the door, it's much harder for it to happen. So this is how God works. He puts a burden on your heart, and then you just go to work keeping the door open of whatever that thing is, and then watch what happens. Watch what he does. And don't be discouraged if you don't see it all right away. Because the things we do in secret, he rewards openly. Maybe not in the perfect timing that you would think, but he doesn't need that. Hopefully we don't need it either. So I'm just trying to encourage you to... Uh, Keep on fasting and praying for these 21 days. Remember that picture of the high and lofty one, that we can dwell with the high and lofty one if we're contrite and humble in spirit. And we're saying, Lord, I'm, I'm willing to have a reset in my life. I'm willing to allow you to reprioritize how I'm spending my time and, and what I think is most important because your ways are better than my ways. I'll finish here. It says, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. Now, this is a man uh, who, if you follow Lance Wall now at all, he's a good friend and somebody we've known for a really long time. And he came out of the business. First, he was in ministry, then in business, and he went back and forth, was a pastor for many years, consultant for many years, and he talked about something called convergence. All right, and convergence is when you, when you find out what the gift is that God has placed in you, and then your life brings you to a place where you can fully utilize all those gifts to the full advantage that God would have for you. Um, so if you know who Heidi Baker is, that's a person who's living in convergence, right? She found out what God wanted her to do, and now she's doing it, and the results are amazing, right? Because that's what happens. It's all this different momentum. So Paul is operating in the apostolic calling that he has, right? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. That's Ephesians chapter 4. That's called the fivefold ministry. He's operating as an apostle because he went to each of these towns originally, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, and started churches there. Even though he was persecuted, it was chased all the way to Athens, right? Like they didn't want him anywhere near there. But the seed that he planted grew. And as he's going back as an apostle, he's, he's not there to stay and be the pastor. He was there to start the church, train them up, raise up disciples, and then move on. And then do it again. And then do it again. He wasn't interested in a big 401k plan and a big retirement plan. He was going to go, go down swinging. And he did. Because he said, this light and momentary affliction that we're facing now is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed through us. God's going to reveal his glory through us when we find that place of convergence. So this is just a normal way to describe what an apostle would do, even though there weren't a lot of apostles, let's say, with this role in the early church. But Paul was certainly a role model of one. And what did he do? He strengthened the souls of the disciples, and he exhorted them continue in the faith, to continue in the faith. 
we're at this place right now in America where we need to do this for people because they've gotten some bad habits. They've gotten some bad habits. Look, again, I'm not saying it to, to hurt anybody's feelings, but yeah, you just have to look at the way COVID has shifted people's habits. And we need community. We need to be with each other. Zoom is better than nothing. But we also need to be with people, okay? I'm just going to leave it at that. I know there's people that can't be right now for health reasons. So that's not who I'm trying to address right now. It's the people who can be with somebody who are opting not to. That's not good. And I said it before, the metaverse idea is not good. Right? We don't want to spend all of our time living in a fantasized world. That's not what God created us to do. There's something about when two or more are gathered in my name, I am there with them. That's who the church is. So be careful of the metaverse. So he's strengthening the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Now, as a guy who had just gotten stoned, <laughs> not with marijuana, killed, he could say this with quite amount of conviction, couldn't he? We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. If we're going to walk into a territory and flip the paradigm and say you need to understand that you're flying the plane upside down right now and God's got a better way. They're not going to like it. So it's easy just to clam up and not say anything. But we're going to have to give an account, right? Not that we should do it out of, out of fear of the Lord other than if what God gave you is so good, tell somebody. Let them know that they can be free too. And that's driven by love. So he's saying, look, this is not unusual as a Christian. If you want to get in the kingdom of God, there's going to be some tribulations. And when they had appointed elders in every church, what did they do? Prayed with fasting, and they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So there we go. That's, that's the theme that we're in right now. It's a 21-day fast. Uh, Trisha's going to be talking about tearing down strongholds and, and the importance of our confession and as a man thinks Right, that's, that's where the battlefield is. That was the book that Joyce Meyer wrote, The Battlefield of the Mind. So that, that's all very pertinent to a 21-day fast. I'm asking everybody to take notes, keep a journal, write down what the Lord is showing you. Don't worry. If it seems like a fragment of an idea, write it down. He's going to be bringing things up in your memory that when you look at the fragment, it might not make a lot of sense. But when you look back over a week or two, you start to see connecting of the dots. Let's stand. Very grateful for you all. Thank you for your commitment to the Lord and for loving God and for being willing to uh, show it by being here with us. And we're believing for revival, amen? We're believing for people to get saved and delivered and, and having those chains broke off them that we were singing about tonight. Um, and maybe we could just lift our hands and just, just make that prayer. Lord, we need to see your spirit move in this whole region, overtake the darkness, and, and allow that revival fire to burn in this region. We're not going to be satisfied with watching people die and go to hell without ever even having heard the truth of the word of God. We just ask you to use us mightily. Use us to speak the truth out in love to people who are hurting. They've never been more open to hearing good news when they've heard so much bad news. And we just ask that you would use us as your mouthpiece here in the earth, that as we open our mouths, Lord, you will fill it with your words, and that as we speak it, it will generate life. Generate life and generate breaking off of bondage and chains in people's lives. Help us, Lord, as we fast and pray to hear clearly what the plan is for our lives that you have for us. Not our plan, but your plan in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you all. Dwell with the high and lofty one.